Hello, this is another general psychology mini lecture with Ian McFarlane, and today's topic is how to use what we know about memory to improve the way you study. So this week, we started out talking about sensory memory and how we bring in information from the outside, the, the importance of attention to what makes it into short-term memory followed by encoding methods. We spent some time talking about memory retrieval, including things like recall versus recognition, and looking at the importance of retrieval cues. And finally, we talked about forgetting and some of the processes involved in why we don't remember things that we ought to. So today we're going to talk about how you can incorporate all this information and apply it to your studying so that you can do better in the classroom. And we're going to start out talking about encoding. Now, we remember that studying usually involves effortful encoding rather than automatic. Okay, although I have tried in the class to get you more involved in classroom activities to make some of the information uh, perhaps automatically encode, but Unfortunately, you won't be able to count on that as sufficient for your exam. So one thing we need to think about is the process of how we organize material. Um, we will remember better when we begin to organize information when it's coming in. Okay, so as you're learning information, you want to organize it in some way that makes conceptual sense to you. Remember that semantic encoding, which is encoding based on the meanings that you attach to the uh, material, is the most stable and easiest form of encoding to retrieve later. So it would be to your advantage to perhaps use the Cornell method of taking notes. Now the Cornell method is where you take notes on your, on your paper, but you keep a column on the left where you organize your material as you go uh, using you know, headings or being able to tie it and connect it to other material. Um, it also helps when if you review your notes uh, shortly after lecture, perhaps that same day, perhaps the next day, to rewrite your notes and organize them in a way that makes sense to you. This might be you know, putting all the theorists together, uh, matching theorists to their uh, research studies, uh, organizing concepts and adding examples, whatever makes sense to you. But the more you organize your material, the better shape you're going to be in. Uh, the next uh, tip for, for effortful encoding is to space out your practice. Uh, psychologists often talk about this as distributed practice. Now you've probably heard over and over again that you probably shouldn't cram. Now the science behind that is when you are taking in massive amounts of information at once, uh, you're not able to sort that material clearly, you're not able to draw connections and organize it effectively. Uh, essentially you're just trying to take too much information and jam it into your memory at once. Uh, you're in much better shape if you space that out. Uh, and research has shown time and time again that even little bits of studying spaced out over a long period of time will make a huge difference. So for example, instead of studying uh, constantly for 24 hours before the test, if you just spent 15 to 20 minutes a day going over material, uh, you would be in a much better place. Okay, You'll be able to strengthen the connections of that material to you'll be able to link it with other information and you'll be able to do this in manageable chunks. Um, also if you're doing it as you go you're able to focus more on new material uh, while you just kind of periodically refresh information uh, from the past. We'll talk more about that in a little bit here. Um, I already mentioned semantic encoding, uh, so it's important that you attach meaning to what you're learning. Okay, Just memorizing words or uh, definitions is really tough. Okay, You remember things better when you have a th more thorough understanding of what you're trying to encode. Okay, This is a place where if you can make personal connections, uh, if you can create 
uh, stories that go along with things. If you're able to describe and apply the material rather than just be able to reproduce a definition, you're going to be in much better shape. A great way to practice this is with someone who's not currently taking psychology and to try to explain some of the concepts from class to that person. This could be a roommate or a friend or a family member, really could be just about anybody uh, as long as they're willing to listen. Now, if it's a, a friend at school or a roommate, uh, you may offer to do this uh, for them too. The idea being if you can explain it to someone who doesn't have the background, then you're likely in good shape. Whereas if that person's not able to understand what you're trying to explain, then perhaps you don't know it quite as well as you thought you did. Uh, and this goes hand in hand with the next principle, which is elaboration. This is the extent to which you can go beyond what the simple definition of something is, and you can create additional information that's relevant, and uh, it's even better if you can connect this to your personal life somehow. Okay, again, you start to make use of that automatic encoding, which is stronger than the effortful encoding. So for example, as you're trying to remember how an action potential works, it may be helpful to think about the demonstration we did in class, where you and your classmates actually acted out how an action potential functions. This may be useful for you to remember the different ways that a drug can either interfere with or enhance the likelihood of an action potential being transmitted to the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, since you were engaged in that demonstration, you may be able to understand it or it may be easier to recall than simply breaking down a diagram that you see in the textbook. Another form of elaboration is the use of mnemonics. Mnemonics are memory devices that you use uh, in order to make information easier to uh, recall. Uh, for example, a lot of people learn how to uh, memorize the cardinal directions with uh, never eat soggy waffles, north, east, south, west. As you move around the compass, there's a little memory device, uh, a little saying that helps you remember the major points. Another example would be when you're learning music scales, uh, when you're looking at the treble clef, the, the, the little saying for remembering what notes go for each line is every good boy does fine. Okay, there are examples of this for all kinds of different things. There are a number of different types of mnemonics. Uh, another way to use mnemonics in a more visual way rather than an auditory way is to picture yourself moving through a room and then each uh, item you encounter as you move through that room uh, represents something that you're trying to recall. Okay, there's lots of different methods you can use, and if you look up uh, mnemonics online, there will be tons of information about different ways you could go about it. So now that we've talked some about encoding and how you can use that to your advantage, uh, we, I want to spend a minute talking about recall. Uh, and specifically, one piece of, that I want you to be aware of is called interference. Interference is how information that you are currently bringing in affects either information you already had or information you will learn in the future. Okay, and specifically some information that you take in is going to be similar to other things you learn and if it's too similar it can interfere with your ability to retrieve information. Now there's two different types of interference. Uh, proactive interference uh, happens when old information, stuff you already know, gets in the way of trying to learn and remember new information. So for example, perhaps you took Spanish in high school and here in college you decide you want to take French. Now since these are both based in Latin, there's a lot of words that are fairly similar between the two. Uh, and it may be that you, when you try to learn a new French word for something, uh, you struggle because you keep recalling the original Spanish word you had for it. This is an example of proactive interference because the original memory is reaching forward to interfere with the acquisition of new information. Okay, so the block is for what's coming ahead, 
So that's proactive. The other type of interference is retroactive interference. And this works in exactly the opposite way. So this is when new information kind of overwrites or blocks old information from being recalled. Now if we use that same example of knowing Spanish and learning French, it'd be retroactive interference if as you learn the French words for something, you are no longer able to recall how to say the same words in Spanish. Okay, again, it's retroactive because the new information is causing mistakes in the, for what was already present. It's working backwards to old memory and damaging that, as opposed to the old memory reaching forward in proactive interference. This concept of affects your studying in that you need to be careful about the, the way you take in information, particularly information that may be similar to things you learned in the past. You want to be sure to pay extra attention in these situations so that you are not losing information you had before if you still need it, but also that the new information is encoded separately. This is where the elaboration can be particularly important because if you can create kind of new meanings or new personal attachments to the new material, that will help distinguish it from the old material, okay, which will have a separate set of semantic meanings because you have attached different meanings and different memories to that than you do the new information. There are also several other ways you can use uh, what we've learned about memory to improve your study skills. Um, one thing is to really uh, think about studying as a job, okay, when you're looking at learning new material. And we can learn a lot uh, in this case from uh, people like athletes, musicians, and actors. Okay, when these people are trying to uh, learn a new skill, whether that's playing a position or learning plays uh, for an athlete, whether that is learning uh, a certain piece of music or a certain script for performing artists. You need to practice similarly to how you want to perform when the stakes are high. So if you think about athletes, they may do walkthroughs of new plays, but they're going to practice uh, the plays at full speed before they use them in a game. Similarly, um, musicians, they need to play the piece the entire way through when they practice. If you just practice isolated parts of it, or if they only play it by themselves without hearing how everyone else is going to play, uh, the performance uh, when there's actually an audience there isn't going to be as good. So stretching this analogy to study skills, you need to practice recalling information in ways that are going to simulate how you're going to be required to use it later. So for many lower level college courses, that's going to mean performing on exams. Okay, so you need to simulate these exams as a way to figure out how prepared you are to take them. Uh, in other classes, or even also in lower level classes, it may be by giving presentations or answering questions or leading discussions about a reading. Okay, whatever it is, uh, the more similar your practice is to what your performance needs to be, the better off you're going to be. This leads me to the number one mistake that students make when they're studying. Uh, students often say that their primary study method is to just reread their notes. Okay, they go through and read their notes uh, before the exam, perhaps a number of times. They may go back to the original text and read that over and over. Simply re reading the notes is not sufficient. Okay, what, what is happening here is you get a false impression of mastery. Okay, you're mistaking familiarity with the material with the ability to really command the material. Okay, so while you will become increasingly familiar with the content, you're not practicing having to recall the content independent of all the retrieval cues. So a much better use of your time is to try to reorganize your notes. 
There are a number of different ways to do that. One example you could do is to try to reorganize everything into a concept map. A concept map is kind of like a flowchart where you take the major ideas of the unit or the chapter or the class as a whole and you organize them and try to find connections between them. Okay, try to turn kind of these isolated bits of information into part of a connected web of information. Okay, this is really helpful because it'll as you build connections between concepts, it gets easier and easier to recall them. Uh, another way you could do this if you're going to go through your, your notes or your text again is to take the section headings and turn them into questions. So uh, if the section in the textbook is labeled uh, the role of the hippocampus in memory, then turn that into the question and ask yourself what role does the hippocampus play in memory? And then without looking at the text, try to describe that to yourself. Try to write out that as, as if you were writing out a test question response to that. And then go back and use the reading or your notes to check your work. Okay, you want to, again, be simulating uh, the exam as much as you can when you're studying. Okay, there are a number of other ways uh, to make your study habits more similar to the exam. Uh, one is what we call interleaving content. So this is a strategy that often makes students uncomfortable. The idea here is you don't study uh, kind of straight through the content. So you wouldn't start at the first lecture for the test and then start go to the second and then go to the third and then the fourth and so on. This again gives you a false impression of mastery. Okay, because you're studying the material among all kinds of retrieval cues that help you pull out the information. Okay, when you interleave content, essentially you're taking all your material and you want to mix it all up. So for example, if you review the how the action potential works, Okay, don't also review the structure of neurons at the same time. Right after that, jump up to uh, different types of forgetting and how that works. Then you can jump to um, the impact of, disc of concussions and the warning signs for concussions. And then move to uh, different methods for encoding. When you get to the exam, material isn't necessarily going to be presented in the same orderly fashion that it is when you study. So this applies not only within classes, but also between classes. So I know a lot of students like to study uh, just for one class and then finish that and move on to studying for another class. Okay, but it actually can be really beneficial to study for 15 or 20 minutes of psychology and then move on to 15 or 20 minutes of your biology, 15 or 20 minutes of your mythology, 15 or 20 minutes of your language, or whatever your other classes are. Again, this helps you get in the habit of having to change direction, having to have mental flexibility, and to retrieve information without uh, contextual cues. Now, a fairly common strategy people use is flashcards. And that's great. Flashcards can be a very effective method of studying. But you need to make sure that you're using flashcards effectively. Uh, often what happens is people will go through flashcards in the same way every time. So for example, if your flashcards are to learn definitions, uh, you'll you typically go through and take the term and then try to define it. Okay, what happens less frequently is people will flip the cards around and go from the definitions and try to pick the words. Okay, you need to go through them in both directions. Okay, I also encourage you to shuffle your flashcards periodically so that you don't get used to uh, them coming in a certain order. Shuffling them uh, helps you make sure you really know the material because you can't rely on remembering that retroactive uh, interference comes just before uh, hippocampus in your list of flashcards. Okay, similarly, when you are going through your flashcards, we have a habit of spending time equally on each flashcard. 
while that seems like a good idea, uh, the problem is we spend more, we spend a lot of time on stuff we already know, and we don't spend enough time on the ones that we have trouble with. Okay, so when you make your flashcards and you're going through them, okay, you want to organize them so that the ones you get wrong, you practice more often because you need more practice, versus the ones you get right, you can practice less frequently, just enough to make sure you don't forget them. Okay, another flashcard tip is to be making flashcards after every lecture or after every chapter you read. This way you can space out your studying, remember the benefits of distributed practice, and it gives you a chance to learn the material bit by bit as you go, rather than making all your flashcards four or five days ahead of the exam and having to basically relearn all that material rather than just refresh it. Another strategy is to study in groups. A lot of people don't like studying in groups and a lot of people have had negative experiences. Now that's not surprising because most study groups don't work effectively. Study groups work best when all the members agree to a certain set of expectations and then follow them. For example, study groups are not the time to be learning the material for the first time. Okay, if you set up a responsible study group, everyone needs to have tried the material on their own first, and then you get together to go through and compare answers, compare solutions, or to ask each other questions when you got stuck. Using study group time to work through problems for the first time together is typically not an effective use of your time. If everyone has attempted the questions on their own, then you can focus the time on helping members make sure they understand the concepts and how to apply them, rather than going through material that all of you understand. So I'd encourage you to find a few classmates who have similar priorities and similar expectations and can agree to a certain set of ground rules and, and give study groups a try. Now some of you will still not be interested in studying in groups and that's fine. What I would encourage you to do and another great use of study groups is to individually make practice tests and then distribute them among the people in your study group. This is a great way for you to simulate taking the exam and is probably the best way for you to really assess if you're ready to take the exam or not. Okay, when you make a practice question, it helps you think about what's important. It helps you sort out what is the correct answer versus possible answers that would look correct at first glance but truly aren't. It gives you a chance in writing open-ended questions to think about how uh, concepts are, con are related or different at a large level. And then if you have three people in your study group and you all make a practice test and trade them, you have three exams you can take to help you prepare for the exam you're going to take in class. Okay, and actually take the practice tests like their exam. Sit down for 50 minutes, work your way through, don't consult your notes until afterwards. It can be uncomfortable because you may get a lot of questions wrong at first. But it's better to find out you're not prepared ahead of time when you still have time to go back and brush up on the material you missed than to give yourself a false sense of mastery, get to the exam, and then produce at a low level because you weren't really prepared. So to wrap up, we went through tips for effortful encoding, uh, including spacing out practice, reorganizing notes, and adding meaning and elaboration to the information you're studying. We went over the concepts of proactive and retroactive interference and talked about the importance of elaboration to help prevent that from happening. And then we went through the actual logistics of setting yourself up to study as similarly to the exam as possible. If you have any questions about what I went over in this mini lecture, feel free to send me an email or come by my office hours. I hope this helps you study, and I look forward to seeing you in class.